This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 76, recorded on September 2nd, 2014. Hello everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello Vincent. Dixon, it's been a long time since we it's did it. It's been a, a while. It has been a while. Between you and I. This is true. Although we've seen each other. Way more than I need. Way more than <laughs> I, you took the words out of my mouth. Well, there have been uh, quite a few good parasite papers in the There meanwhile. has been. There has been. Although our last twip was with Bobby Pritt. That's true. A number of people like that, but That's there's good. only one Bobby Pritt in the world, so... Well, yeah. There are, other, there are other people out there, though, that we need to contact to get them on here because they have their stories to tell Plenty as well. of people. So why don't well, we do that? Well, we, we've been trying. You know, <laughs> trust me. Try trying. harder. Try harder. That's right. I know some parasitologists. Well... Okay, then let's uh, see in if fact, we can... In fact, there's one right here in New York City. This is true. There's there there a couple, many. and we'll get them. Yeah, we will. Summer's over. It is. Not no, officially, not officially. But psychologically, it's over. Yeah. July, June, July, yeah, August. Yeah, I kind of miss... So I love June, July, August. Well, step outside today. What's the weather like? It's very humid, yes, but that won't last. It's 94 degrees out there, and... Love it. 68% love it. humidity. I wish I could be outside. I went out for lunch, I, I, and I, I wish just, I hadn't. I just love the hot, humid weather. You do? I'd be good working in the tropics. I actually grew up as a kid in New Orleans during the summers. Summer well, in New Orleans? You said you were only there for one year. No, 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 no. I, I vacationed back there. I, I, I Wait, actually stayed with my grandparents. We just heard your history on TWIV 300. We did, we did. Were you, you were born in New Orleans. I was born in New Orleans. You left after a year. After a year, but then my father and mother split up, and during that time... Mm-hmm. The kids, my sister and myself, were sent back to the grandparents in New Orleans, and that's that's where we stayed for at least three or four years in the summers. And you you grew up in California somewhere, right? That's right, near San Lorenzo, near where Condit grew up. Exactly. Funny. All right, so today it's thirty three Celsius with fifty five percent humidity. 55. Feels like thirty seven, which is a good number because translated to Fahrenheit, that's ninety eight point six body temperature. Body temperature. Right. And there is an active weather alert. Air quality alert until right. 10 p.m. Right. A lot of ozone at the surface and not enough Yeah, a lot of ozone. Now, why would there be a lot of ozone on a hot day like well, this? The, because the, the atmosphere can hold more the higher the temperature. And the ozone, do you guess where that comes from? Automobile exhaust. That's the only source or the main source? It's the main source. What about jet power planes? Plants, no, coal burning power plants, that sort of thing, too. Uh, even natural gas. What's the chemical there? formula of ozone, Dixon? O3. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically. <clears throat> and why, why is ozone bad? No, no, let's start with why is ozone good first, okay? Okay. Ozone in the stratosphere intercepts UVB radiation. Okay. Guess what creates ozone in the stratosphere? Sunlight? UVB radiation. Oh, it stops what it creates it, huh? Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's kind of strange, but that's the way it works. Well, it's a feedback loop, right? The more UV... Well, I think UV is probably constant, right? The UVB radiation During is constant, the day. and the UVB... Well, maybe it would... De- on the outer... The stratosphere is... But there are some things high up, right, that Dixon? deplete the ozone layer in the stratosphere. Yeah, like chlorofluorocarbons? Chlorine molecules yeah. can scavenge millions of ozone All right, so it's good molecules. up there. But why is it bad down here? Well, because you breathe it in. And it doesn't bind hemoglobin? It's an re- oxygen reaction uh, that really is not so good because it releases <laughs> one O, which then needs to couple to something else. So it starts to oxidize your tissues. Mm-hmm. That's not good. So, so there's a state in the United States that has the highest surface ozone alert system of any other state. And they have a good reason for it, too. It's North Carolina. If you go to their website, the state of North Carolina actually has an ozone alert um, section mm-hmm. to it. Now they have two highways, I-95, which goes all the way to Florida. And then I think the other one is uh, 40 yeah, which goes from one end of the state to the other. And people living at the crossroads of those two major highways 
are highly susceptible to the effects of surface ozone. And there's a lot of uh, cancellations of classes and kids miss school and there's a lot of uh, admits to hospitals at, at, at certain times of the year. And um, Okay. So ozone at the surface is not so great, and not enough ozone in the in the stratosphere is not so great. And you're saying that on the um, on a hot day, yeah, there's more ozone it's, in the atmosphere. More, there's more ozone, and there's more of a hazard of just being outside. And so they have um, ozone on surface alert days. Okay. Okay, which has nothing to do, of nothing course, with our with current pacifism. subject. But it's nice to wander every now and then into subject uh, areas that we know nothing and about, and this was one of them. <laughs> so the paper today, um, yes, we had to do for two reasons. First, yeah, made the cover of Science. It did. What What do we see on the cover? It's the August first issue of Science magazine. Right. What is that? A picture of Dixon? It's a scanning electron micrograph of the head of a toxic Harakanus nematode. A nematode, yes. which we did on TWIP. Didn't we lots do Toxicara? Of, we've done lots of them. Yes, we have. It's a related worm to Ascaris, which is that pencil size worm that lives in the small intestine of humans. Humans. But pigs. Toxicara canis lives in dogs. It's a dog parasite. That's Does right. it infect humans? As a larva, yes. And why Remember? do they have Toxicara? The paper uh, uses it, I suppose, right? They do. That we're gonna, so the two papers in this issue. That's right. On parasites and yes. their interaction with yes. viruses and the immune system. That's right. So we're going to do one of the two because it's yes. quite involved. Yes. And maybe we'll do the other on, hmm, do we have another podcast we could do a parasite virus paper on? Why not? Hmm. Maybe a TWIV. We could do a TWIV on this one. This twiv, is a crossover twiv, paper, twim. by the way. Is equal to Twix, and you have a bag of Twix with <laughs> I, you today. I thought I'd bring you? some Twix in for the... <laughs> well, Dixon... I brought in a bag of Twix, and I didn't get the connection initially. I just yeah, saw well, this chocolate stuff. This has to be sort of reconfigured. The eye has to be made smaller. You know, if we tried to use Twix for our podcast, they would uh, come after us. Of course they would. Because that's probably trademarked. Yeah, even worse than that, of course, we're talking about infectious diseases, and they certainly wouldn't want their name associated with that. Look, they, they have a registered trademark <laughs> thingy in there. It's <laughs> too true. bad. Oh, well. So the one paper, well, we'll do one, but... Yeah. Some one of our listeners who you know very well. He yes. works right here on the floor and he talks to you all the time. Right. <laughs> wrote a letter about this. <laughs> he tries I'd like to, to talk to us. Start by reading this letter. Go ahead. It, he writes his name is Daniel. Right. He writes, Dear Vincent and Dixon. Right. I just returned from the annual meeting of the International Society of Travel Medicine. Right. Do you know that meeting? I do. I do. Chuck Chuck Kinersh is a member of that society. Here we as go. Well. No, I'm not a physician, so it's usually just closed off to physicians. It's not oh, it's not closed to physicians, but mostly physicians would be interested in going Got to it. the meeting. Where I enjoyed many fantastic lectures and caught more cutthroat trout fly fishing the upper Snake River during one evening than I could count. Right. Now, where was the meeting? <laughs> well, later on, he says, <laughs> I guess it's in Wyoming, right? It was in Jackson. Oh, that's where our colleague has a yeah, house, exactly right? Exactly right. And a lot of other people. Wait, too. is it Jackson or Jackson Hole? There's only one town. It's called Jackson. What's Jackson Hole? It's sort of a suburb of Jackson. Okay. And it's a, it's a artificial. So there's good fishing in Jackson. It's wonderful. The Snake River goes right down through the middle of it. And our colleague doesn't fish, does he? Not yet. I think he <laughs> I'm will. Working on it. <laughs> Are you going to go visit him and fish with him? I would like to teach him because I think he needs to learn. Why don't you do that? He needs a hobby. You're friendly enough with him? I, I, I think so. Hmm. All right. So he he caught cutthroat fly. Trouts. Oh, um, right. Have you ever fished this river? Many times. Okay. Many times. It's a, it's a beautiful... Be it's the one that immortalized by Ansel Adams mm -hmm. when he photographed the Tetons and the Snake River that you see We're winding its way through. through. Is that why it's called the Snake River? It, it is, snakes actually. It, it, it meanders, as it were. I will... I'm continuing with Daniel's yes, letter. I will confess to using a hopper with a bead head dropper to achieve this. <laughs> I have no idea what he's talking That's about. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Just have to do with I'll explain it to right? you later. <laughs> I was relaxing on this beautiful Sunday morning with a cup of coffee in hand and the August 1st issue of Science. Right. To my delight, I saw that the cover had a colorized scanning micrograph of a dog roundworm, Toxocara canis. Exactly. The image on the cover directed the reader to a commentary and to two research reports about how infection with parasites influences the immune system in such a way that antiviral immunity is impaired. That antiviral immunity is impaired. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. This is a worm infecting a dog, and it affects the way the dog interacts with its viruses? 
How can that be? You know, Dixon, in How the real world... Be? And I mean, hosts I'm are just, infected I'm by just, many things, right? I'm in the sort lab, of having we tend fun to, with this. In the lab, we tend to just infect with one. Right? We silo our infections, and we tend to isolate them and study them so we think. in their pristine state. So we think. And it, because it, as you know, animals have microbiomes. Of course so they So they're do. never pristine unless you do. choose to use notobiotic animals, That's which right. you did. I did. Let's finish with Daniel's yeah, letter. Please. I am an MD trained as an infectious disease specialist and am active in the care of immigrants, travelers, and indigent patients suffering from infectious diseases. At NYU School of Medicine, I received excellent training in parasitic disease from a dynamic visiting professor that has served me well in China, Africa, Nepal, and here in the States. My PhD is in immunology, and my early work involved defining the phenotype of human B1 cells and an innate subset of B cells. My current work is on HIV latency and hematopoietic stem cells. These research reports were thus, as they say, right up my alley. The commentary is readily accessible to a broad audience and explains how the two research reports demonstrate that helminth infections induce viral exit from a latent state. The two research reports contain the expected rigor one sees in science. These right. reports seem a perfect crossing of both your areas of focus, Vincent's expertise in virology and Dixon's expertise in eukaryotic parasites. Schistosomiasis mansoni is one of the parasites involved in the first article and one even my kids know about mm -hmm. after swimming in Lake Malawi this past winter. Trichinella is used in the second paper and is not only dear to Dixon's heart, but something we still see up in Alaska where I worked until recently. To fully disclose my fascination with parasites, the discussion my physician friend from Alaska and I were having as we caught cutthroat trout on the snake last week was about the two cases of acute trichinosis that he recently managed in a married Alaska couple from eating undercooked bear meat. I'm left thinking that Dixon needs to finish, sorry, needs to fish the upper snake river in Wyoming, but more importantly, he might consider writing a monograph entitled Not People, Parasites, and Plowshares, but Parasites, When Plowshares Become Swords. Oh, my. Sincerely, Daniel, who is an associate research scientist here at Columbia University. No, I know him very well. We, we, yeah, he's always talking to you. We actually um, traveled together to the ASTM and H meeting last year. You did? Yeah, we did. Uh, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. I didn't know that you went to that meeting. I did. You didn't mention it. Um, you weren't interested. Nobody in asked. <laughs> well, when you disappear, I figure you're fishing or no, we, going to Peru. We, <laughs> sometimes I am, but but I went down there so that the authors of our parasitic disease um, textbook could meet. Yeah, that's right. And you told so, me it was in Washington, yeah, right? Yeah, it was. That's right. That's Good. Right. Well, uh, this is, these are a pair of nice papers. We're going to do one. Yes. And one we're going to do is uh, entitled. Did you hear that? I did. <laughs> Hel Helminth infection. <laughs> if you'd like me to read the title for you, I'd be happy you to. You can read it. It's fine. Go ahead. It says, Helminth infection reactivates latent gamma herpes virus via cytokine competition at a viral promoter. This paper is rather heavy. All I right, would we're say. We're going to try Even though it's only five it. pages long. I know that. Well, you know, the thing about science papers is they compress it. They don't they let do. you write. I know, I know. They don't let you know. make flowery writing that it ex espouses <laughs> what you've done. They want it compressed where one sentence has 50 uh, figures. Drugonistic, no, uh, abbreviated. 50 figures buried in one sentence. <laughs> True. Which I thoroughly resent. Because this is, an, this is an instance where they're trying to keep it compressed yeah. to save money so yeah. they can increase their buck yield. Yeah, and this well. really bugs me. Now, I don't mind people making a living. But if you compromise the science paper because you're trying to save a buck, I think that's crappy. Uh -huh. And all these high-profile journals are guilty of that. Well, you know now, what? There is one, a brand new one called eLife, which lets you write as much as you want. eLife sounds to me like it's an online subscription. It is. It's published by a number of uh, societies, but and it's also elitist as well, okay? Uh, and that's a problem. Mm. But at least they let you write. They let you write a scholarly paper in which you can explain things in each paragraph. This is so dense, it's difficult. And it's also a lot of immunology, but we'll try and explain it. Okay. Now, this is from the laboratory of Herbert Virgin, who I've known for many years, okay. a virologist, right. a well-trained fellow who was trained, as, he's an MD, Good. PhD, and yep. he was trained in the laboratory of Bernie Fields, oh, yeah. who was a famous virologist at Harvard. Herpes? Uh, no, Rio viruses. Oh, Rio, okay. He used Rio viruses okay. to study viral pathogenesis in mice. Cool. Good guy. 
Fields Virology was named after him. Okay. He's no longer with us. I was fortunate to interact with him. And I met Virgin there years ago, and he's in Washington University in St. Louis pursuing sure. viral pathogenesis. And he's right. really interested in this idea of multiple infections of right. a single host because that's what the real world is like. Indeed. You and I, Dixon, yes. have at least a dozen viruses in us. Of in us. Of different sorts. Exactly. A lot of herpes viruses that infected us years ago and it's true. Are, are mostly latent, meaning the genome is pretty quiet. It doesn't yeah, yeah. make virus particles. Yes. yes. Time and time again, you get yes. a fever sore. That's, That's right. herpes virus That's making true. viruses. You're right. Herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, yep. uh, Epstein Barr virus, and a, and a number of others. Then there are many other viruses as well. Got it. So. When you say someone has HIV, for example, yeah, yeah. you have to think about how it's interacting with all these Oh, others. this is true. And this as you know, true. much of the world has parasite infections. They do. Now, uh, the Virgin Lab, one of its subjects is a herpes virus called uh -huh. Gamma Herpes Virus 68. Huh. This they work on because it infects mice. And we like to use mice as a model Convenient. for studying viral yes. pathogenesis. Yes. A gamma herpes virus, well, a human gamma herpes virus would be Epstein Barr virus. What makes virus. it gamma? Oh, they're just classified alpha, beta, gamma. Right. Oh, so what's an alpha herpes? Herpes simplex ah, virus. What's a beta? Cytomegalovirus. What's a <laughs> and gamma are. <laughs> I, uh, I can do the whole Greek alphabet. Epstein Barr. Give me a well, it only goes to gamma. <laughs> Kaposi's sarcoma associated oh, herpes yeah, yeah. virus, all right? Yep, yep. So murine uh, gamma herpes virus. And by the way, there is a typo in the first paragraph uh -oh. of this paper. So it's not only is science compressing oh, dear. the paper, but they can't even typeset it properly. They say gamma herpes virus. Oh, they left no. the H out. Well, maybe it affected the sheriff of Dodge City, Wyatt Earp, <laughs> who had herpes. <laughs> Sorry, anyway, everybody. So you infect mice with gamma herpes virus 68. Um, the mice will become lytically infected. They make virus. Lytically so infected. this so term lytic. Killing cells, killing cells. Killing kill cells, cells, cells and produce infectious virus particles. And right. then... The lytic infection gets turned off, and you have a latent infection. You mean the immune system kicks in and prevents that from happening? immune system works on it, and the virus says, you know what? This is not good for us at this moment. How about that? We're going to lay low yeah. as just genomes. Yeah. Right. Okay? No virus particles. <laughs> Hole in the wall, gang. <laughs> and then when conditions are right, right. the virus is... Mm, we're getting signals from the host. Yes. It's now our time to start replicating. So they, that's called reactivation. They're gonna, this happens with herpes when you get a fever sore. Yeah. There's some that virus. A stress factor. Those there, herpes yes. simplex viruses are latent. The genomes Got are it. latent Got in it. your peripheral Got it. Nervous, ganglia. Nervous system. That's right. And then on some stimulus. Yes. Sunlight, you know, UV stress, stress, taking an exam, fever. There you go. You get a fever sore, which represents the virus starting to replicate in the ganglia and traveling down the axon to the lip. Right. And then those viruses are shed on your lip. Right. And guess what? You can spread them to you other people. Can, and yeah. I'm in my professorial element here. I can I see really that. enjoy this. I like so I like what it a strategy. When you talk dirty. <laughs> <laughs> what a strategy. The virus is quiet. It's below right. the radar of the immune right. system. Right, right. And then just at the right time, which we really don't ex understand very well. Why is well. that the right time, though? Because the host is compromised from something else. There's a stress. Do you only maybe kick them when you're down? Is that the idea? Kick them when you're down? No, I, I just, I, I, we don't understand. I don't know well, why that's herpes good. simplex, there are certain signals that we know no, are associated I, I, with reactivation. For the yeah. other latent herpes viruses, we really don't know what causes them to reactivate. Okay. You know, CMV, okay. Epstein, okay. Bar, et cetera, okay. et cetera. Okay. Um, well, we lo know a little more for EBV. But this is a good strategy because the genome stays with you for your lifetime. It doesn't kill you unless you have immune problems. And then periodically it reactivates to spread to other hosts. And that's, of course, right. the raison d'etre of a virus, to spread <laughs> to French. other hosts. <laughs> <laughs> so this murine gamma-68... Yep. I'm making this twiv. I'm so sorry. No, 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 but no. Really this is a half and half show. It's this. the only thing I know. No, that's viruses. not true at all. That's, you know what? That's not true. I know that's nothing not. else. So I well, you've suffered through 76 that. twips. <laughs> you should know something now. <laughs> and so they use this as a model. Okay. Right, right. This, um, th this is a very interesting uh, virus. 
the, the Virgin Lab previously has published that in mice latently infected with murine yeah. gamma herpes virus 68. These are in macrophages, right? Yeah, it's one of the main latent targets. Isn't of the that virus. interesting? Yeah. That's the cell that's supposed to kill off all this stuff, and here you have yeah, a, the genome is in it. The Trojan it, horse. It's a Trojan horse. It's kind of kind of sneaky. Right? It is really. These mice that are latently infected. Yes. That is genomes, no virus particles made. Right. They have enhanced resistance to infection with bacterial pathogens like listeria. Enhanced resistance. Yeah, they're they're more resistant okay. than uninfected mice. So the virus does confer some degree of advantage to the host by being latent. This was done over ten years ago. This would you say that? Would yes. you say that's true? And it has stimulated the notion that in humans, virus infections can be good. Right. But there's been scant beneficial, support of that good. outside. Beneficial. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, there yeah, has been yeah. scant support of this. Nevertheless, the idea is that there is a low level of interferon gamma in Got these it. latently infected Got mice. It. That keeps the yep. virus suppressed, yep. which we'll learn about more today. Okay. And it prevents infection with other bacteria. So without the virus, you don't have this low level of That's circulating interferon gamma. Yep. Should we explain what interferons are? If you'd like. Um, I think a lot of people know this already because uh, organisms really? like Toxoplasma gondii. Well, you know, we them. have a lot of non-scientists listening. Okay, so Interferons go are for proteins, it. part of the innate immune system, right. that we don't produce a lot of unless we get infected. Then our, our bodies and sen sense that we are infected and turn on the synthesis of interferons. Ramp it and up. there are a number of them. The most famous are alpha, beta, and gamma. gamma. These interferons bind two receptors on the surface of right. cells and they induce a signaling pathway which we will talk about today that then results in the synthesis of many many gene products who who which are antiviral or antibacterial or whatever your microbe is. NF-kappa B is one of those? NF-kappa B is one of the signaling proteins okay. between the interferon okay. receptor and the nucleus. And stats In it are itself, others? stats are signaling proteins. These have no okay. antimicrobial activity on Got their it. own. Got it. If but, you mix them with a virus, the virus would say, yeah. meh, meh. Meh. That's a good word for New Yorkers, meh. But, <laughs> yeah. and same with interferon. If you mixed interferon right. with a virus particle, it would do nothing to it. Yes. However, the genes induced by yeah. these proteins... Can you name one of these? They call them interferon-induced genes or interferon-stimulated genes, ISGs. Can you name one of them, Dixon? Rig one? <laughs> <laughs> it's a rig I. I, I probably can't. It, rig I is actually interferon-induced, but it is a sensor. Okay. It's not an antiviral protein. Okay. Uh, uh, the, nitric oxide. So the, the enzyme that produces nitric oxide, nitric oxide synthase is, is an interferon-induced interfer gene right. product. No, I kind of knew that, actually. Right? Intuitively. It takes arginine yeah. and makes nitric oxide. It takes the nit amino group from it and Bingo. Creates. That's right. You're a chemist. Ba-boom. Well, malaria does similar things. chemistry. Malaria does some other things. Breaking bad. Yeah. A breaking bad. <laughs> I just Making mess. saw the scene where he takes a, 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 what he, the uh. guy thought was a crystal. He said, this is not meth. This is something. He threw it and it blew up. Remember that? Oh, I don't watch that show. Tricky chemistry. Didn't watch that show. Anyway. <clears throat> Rogue biochemists don't interest me. He's, not, he's a very serious chemist. He's not a biochemist. He's a chemist. All right. What is a, what's the difference between biochemistry and chemistry, Dixon? Well, Vincent, if it doesn't involve nitrogen and oxygen and carbon, then I presume that it's an inorganic chemist that you're dealing with. Crystal meth is, is probably organic chemistry. I think right? it would be organic. I, I, you could be Bio organic. means that it was made by some biological system, right? We're involved in life. Yeah. So anyway, these that's how interferons work. Okay. They're, they're, viruses sense infection, like they sense RNA. How many different... They starting induce, with the receptor and interferon, how many different protein pathways are there for the innate immune system, would you guess? Uh, we know of uh, three. We Just know three. there's an NF-kappa B pathway. There are pathways involving other signaling proteins, and the end result are different sets of proteins. These are called oh. cytokines that okay. are induced. Okay. Okay. We have actually okay. we have we have some cytokines that are pro-inflammatory, and others that, that are turn it down. That turn right. it down, which would be called immunosuppressive. Right. You have to be right. able to control it in both ways. Yeah, everything we do as an organism has to be controlled. Otherwise, it's a tuner. Boom. It's a tuner. 
if you don't control the immune system, you're in trouble. Right. Well, th there's a lot of good examples of that, too. All right, right? so so far we've talked about this gamma-68 herpes virus, which right. is possibly maintained and checked by a low level of interferon gamma, which also, right. parenthetically, protects the mouse from bacterial infections. Okay. Right. So why did they do this? They did this work. This paper is involving these two helminths. Yes. Okay. He he Helig Helig polygyrus. H polygyrus to everybody else. And Schistosomiasis mansoni. Yes. So the or Schistosoma mansoni. They call it Schistosomiasis. Well, that's, that's another wrong. It's wrong, isn't it's it? Correct. It's Look wrong. at this Schistosomiasis. That's the disease. Correct. Oh, this science bothers me. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know. I make mistakes, but I do my it's best. True. And this is a journal whose job is to print yes. science correctly. Yes. Do you remember the series? And you on, know what they would say if I, I if know. I said if anyone was listening They're in going. science, they would say, Big "Well, team. we have so many words; it's <laughs> inevitable that some will get by." I don't care. It's like a surgeon saying, "Well, I have so many right. stitches; I can't get all of them right, exactly. so I'm going to make exactly. a mistake." That's remember not the, acceptable. Remember the TV series Quincy? No, I didn't ever watch TV. Never? No, I don't watch TV. Uh, Quincy was a he was a, a medical examiner, and uh, they brought him a mummy once. I, I, you should have called me out. I just told you about Breaking Bad, man. <laughs> no, I, I don't do that with you, you know, because that's well, dangerous. Cause you want to make me feel bad? No, I but you, 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 you can get the letters. You won't read those letters, I bet. So okay, so here's I read the point. everything we got. Quincy hmm. once diagnosed schistosomiasis in a mummy. He found the eggs in the tissue. Right. All right. And right. said, I know exactly what this is. Guess what he said? This is schistomosiasis. Schistomosiasis. <laughs> and I sat there and roared, schistomosiasis. And I'm sure their, their coach, you know, behind the scenes says, How do you pronounce this word anyway? Uh, schistomosiasis, I guess. I don't know. And so they they, they kind of uh, got it all mixed up. So Did they that. use H. polygyrus. What is H. polygyrus? It's, it's, a, it's a nematode parasite that lives in the gut tract of rats and sometimes mice in the wild. Okay. And it's, a, it's an experimental model. It's the closest worm we have to human hookworm. There is no, there is no mouse or rat hookworm. Mm -hmm. So H. polygyrus, by the way, which used to be called... Pneumatospirides dubious. <laughs> <laughs> dubious? I wasn't sure if it was a parasite. Well, I don't even know why they changed the name of this organism. Because well, it's everybody, a terrible name to have, dubious. Well, look at this one. This isn't so much better. It's a tongue twister of a, of a word. Uh, Heligmosmoides. No one says that that works with this. They just say H. polygyrus. So it's a, it's a rodent parasite. And it's a rodent a parasite that lives in the gut tract. Yeah. That it's, it's biology... Uh, Distantly mimics that of hookworm. Distantly. So it's looked at as a hookworm model that you can use a small rodent. And then Schistosoma mansoni. Schistosoma mansoni mice. will infect rats yeah. and, and mice as well, but it doesn't usually undergo a complete life cycle. Okay. So here's the thesis of this paper. Right. First, probably over 90% of the world is infected with herpes viruses of some sort, right? Bingo. More than one. Yep. And we have we know that these can have immunomodulatory effects in yeah, mice. Yeah, that they can. And most, most much of the world is also infected with parasites, much in particular intestinal helminths. That's correct. Would you say? Yes, I would. Of course I would. Next, intestinal helminths are known to induce a what's called, in which we will explain, a Th2 correct. cytokine response. Correct. correct. All right. Correct. As opposed to viruses, which... Now, there are some examples of helminths that Do induce TH2 both also. TH1 and TH2. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you can't make any generalization about this because everyone is, is specific. And they, they all do different things. But, uh, for instance, the one I worked with most of my life, trichinella, induces both TH1 and yeah, TH2 you can't responses. Make, you shouldn't make it's a, tough. definitive statements like only this. Only, only helminths that. do this. And only, in biology, you'll know, always get true. called out. Right? But the major species, you're absolutely yeah. right. The, the H, the... TH2 responses are mostly antibody-based, right? And the TH1 responses are mostly so, cell Let's talk a killing. little bit about TH. The TH stands for T-helper. Right. And remember, T-cells can be CD4 or 
CD8. CD8. There are many That's other right. there are. different kinds of and they're programmed programs, where regulatory cells, but we won't talk about yeah. those. The program in the lymph node by antigen presenting and cells. Then in well, that's thymus. during development in yeah, the thymus, that's right? That's but true. the mature ones are in the lymph nodes, and right. they're waiting. And then and if you waiting. get an infection, the peptides are brought by antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells or macrophages. They go right. into the lymph node, and they go, oh, I got this yeah. at the periphery. Is this self or non-self? Right. And if it's non-self, the T- there will be a T cell that recognizes it. And then depending on the peptide and also the blend of cytokines that this antigen-presenting cell is producing, so it begins to produce cytokines because it's bound this, this peptide, is true. will cause differentiation of the CD4 cell yep. into either a Th1 or a Th2. Right. And the Th1 favors cellular responses like, yes. like cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Th2 favors antibody production, yeah. B cells. Right. And they're, they're distinct cytokines associated with Th1 and Th2 cells. So, for example, I'm looking at a table here. The yeah. Th1 you need a cheat sheet for will this. produce IL-2, IL-12, and interferon gamma. Uh-huh. Th2 cells will produce IL-4, 5, and 10. Right. And those help to pre- make the antibody or the cellular response predominate. They're involved in the maturation of those responses. Okay. The cool thing is that a Th2 response will antagonize a Th1 and vice versa. Right. Okay? You can't do both you can't at the do same both. time. So, for example... Uh, Th2 responses will enhance the production of 4, 5, and 10, but will suppress interferon gamma. How about that? All right. Now, one more thing we need to know. Ah. And a Th2 response is often called a immunoregulatory response oh, okay. because it opposes the Th1, which is an inflammatory response, uh-huh. kind of response that brings cells in. Right. Th1, remember, is cytotoxic T cell maturation. Those cells I come remember. in, they destroy infected cells, and sure. then other cells That's come right. Inflammation is, yeah, yeah, is yeah. all this activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? right? So these intestinal helminths tend to favor Th2 response, which counters interferon gamma. When you say favor, you mean their antigens tend to induce yes, those correct. kinds of responses. That's correct. When those antigens are picked up by antigen presenting There are cells, many exceptions, of course, and schistosomiasis always, happens to represent one of those crossover right. exceptions, because the eggs induce Th right. type 1 right. responses, the adults induce Th type 2 responses, for the most part. I'm not surprised. For the most part. Now, remember... Th2 will suppress interferon gamma. We already said that this gamma is keeping this gamma herpes virus 68 in check. Right. It's unfortunate that there's right. gamma twice, you know, but that's the way it is. Yeah. So they said, well, these, these helminths, which can suppress interferon gamma, they could have a role in duly infected cells. It's possible. So let's look. Yes. So they said, we have these mice that are infected with right. gamma herpes virus 68. Right. Let's throw in some parasites. Exactly. It's a good experiment, right? It's a good experiment, right? So they do. We used to not think that's true, by the way. What? What's that? Because in the old days, I used to think it's too too yeah, complicated. Too much going on here. <laughs> How can you keep track of all this stuff? Yeah. So you did the reductionist approach. That's right. But now, one animal, one par- one parasite know, or virus. We know enough micro. about each system now to start to put them together to to try to mimic some real world situations. We also have ways of studying. Uh, Much at better a global level, what's That's going right. on, That's whereas correct. previously it was difficult. DNA chips and that sort of thing, yeah. and immune screens, etc. So here it's a very simple experiment. They infect mice with first with gamma herpes virus 68. Right. These mice will produce virus for a while and then yep. become late. They don't die. No, they don't die. They control the infection. Okay. And then the genome remains. Okay. So they infect and then they wait 28 days and they give them intraperitoneally eggs from S. Mansoni or uh, from um, the actual... H. polygyrus. H. Poly- <laughs> I can remember right. that. H. polygyrus. They actually give... What would they give if eggs. not eggs? I well, think give eggs. I guess they give eggs sure, at both. Sure. Yeah, it says so here. Yep. Um, and then they look to see if the virus is replicating. Right. And they do some nice imaging because the virus has a gene, right. a luciferase gene that they could do whole mouse imaging and you could see... You know, replication of the virus. Sure. And what do you think happens, Dixon? What is the presence well, of Well, I already know what happens, so I can just... Makes we, the virus replicate. It was unexpectedly. Ah, they probably expect yeah, But do you it. remember what I said about the okay eggs? Is it okay to expect the result, Dixon? Well, if you think you know what's going on, 
<laughs> it's okay, but if you don't record it and say that it didn't go on when it actually did, that's bad, remember? Yeah, yeah, so if right. it doesn't support your hypothesis. So they used to use Schistosoma mansoni eggs injected intravenously, which used to then end up in the liver, yeah. as a model for delayed hypersensitivity, which is a TH1 response. Mm -hmm. And that's how you got granuloma formation. And right. you could measure the the circle of granuloma around each egg as an index as to the intensity of the granuloma and the, the intensity of the TH1 response. And, and as you did this in the same animal, one month apart for like eight months, like say in a monkey, mm -hmm. the amount of granuloma per egg per dose got smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's when they thought there were actually inhibitors of granuloma, all right? Anti-T cells that kept these from getting too big. And what they noticed in natural infections is that people that have old infections make smaller granuloma against mm -hmm. the eggs that are recently produced mm -hmm. than young children who had never seen this before. So there's a modulation of the amount of granuloma formation. But I think in this case, they were just trying to induce antibodies against the eggs of these parasites. Well, they, they introduced the eggs, which they knew would Right, stimulate a TH2 response leading Correct. to antibody. That's right. And both the trematode and the nematode, eggs of either, reactivate the gamma-68 infection. Right. And they could wait even 100 days after infection. It would still reactivate, which right. is fine. You right. Know, it doesn't, the genome is there, so it's exactly. going to be exactly. reactivated. But couldn't they have just injected something like bovine serum albumin to induce antibodies and see whether or not they could reactivate the herpes? If they're switching the immune responses from a TH1 to a TH2? So you would say anything that induces a TH2? I'm raising the question. Why take a parasite egg when you can use a simple well, protein because antigen? they're trying to mimic what's going on in the world. Well, I, I would have right? maybe suggested... You don't get injected with BSA. <laughs> no, no, of course not. But, <laughs> but if you wanted to just try to shift the immune response from one to the other and see whether or not it had an effect on the herpes, that would have been a good way to try it too. Well, no? as we'll see at the end of this paper, think? right, it's, it involves a TH2 cytokine. Right. So if you, the answer to your question is, if it induced this correct cytokine, then you would see the same effect. Exactly. But they didn't know this, and they were asking the co-infection well, question. That's, right. that's why they used that's, parasite no, that, eggs, they, right? they wanted a real-life situation. That's true. So they say, so this reactivates infection, and they say that the TH2 cytokines may play a role in this, because right? we know right. that the right. the eggs right. of the trematode or the nematode are inducing a TH2 response. So yeah, their yeah, conclusion yeah. is it's probably a TH2, so let's look at that. Let's try and prove that. Right. Does that make sense? Well, not try to prove it, but let's see what the evidence is in favor of... You don't like the word prove? I don't. Why? No, because you can always... Try an experiment, and maybe one of them will disprove everything else that okay. you've ever had there. So, so the support evidence for experiment. The next experiment they did is they did RNA seq. Now, this is something that wasn't existing in your day or my day. <laughs> my day, my day. They barely knew what the genome was. <laughs> See, this is where you take RNA from a cell, yeah, and you sequence it all. Wow. You know, there, there are what twenty thousand different that's incredible mRNAs that do in that. the mammalian cell. Or more, probably. How long does that take to do? It takes a few hours. No. Get just out. Just extract RNA. You could, you could select the poly A containing if you want. Yeah. You make DNA out of it, and then you do deep sequencing. That's incredible. And you get, so you can get really good coverage, and well, you could tell which are the most abundant RNAs and less abundant and less and less by the times you sequence them. It's called RNA-seq. We, we did it not too long ago in my laboratory. It, and if for a similar reason to study immune responses Got to it. a virus in fact you can infect the cell and then take all the rna out and say what genes are turned on and in the old days this was very hard to do but now you can do it in an unbiased way so okay? dna chips are the other way of trying to do that so the, that's the other way we used to do it we used right. to say all right let's get an right. I, we want to make a transcriptional profile that's right. what this is called yeah, that's right, right. That's right. which right. transcription is the synthesis of mrna from sure, dna right sure, 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 sure. so we want a profile in the old days you would put dna oligos yeah, right. for every gene on a glass slide exactly, and then right. hybridize and there's you know that's tedious and there's a bias associated with it but deep sequencing has gotten so fast and so d reliable and so inexpensive that you can now just take total RNA and it's sequence amazing. it. It's amazing. And you get hundredfold coverage 
So in other words, each mRNA can be re represented 100 times in your sequence. Well, you get hundreds of millions well, of bases of sequence. And then well, the problem, Dixon... <laughs> is the sorting it all out, yeah, right? analyzing and it is not it easy because you can't just go out yeah, and right. buy a software package <laughs> on the App Store to do this. <laughs> you have to have people around who know how to do wow. this and wow. can write programs. We have a center for this here? Well, there is a sequence center here that will... see. You give them RNA and they will give you a but that millions and help millions you. of bases. No, they will not help you analyze <laughs> So where do you get the help? You have to get help. You have to find people. And so we went to someone in the Netherlands who I happened see. to be okay. in a car conversation, and he had the expertise. Got it. But it's not easy. So my my conclusion is today, if you are training to be a wet <laughs> biologist, yes. you should also have bioinformatics training. My goodness. Almost everyone my I meet goodness. now, younger than a certain age, right. has training in software. They learn Java and Data Python mining. very Data early mining. on so they can program yeah, yeah. and do all of this. It's yeah. essential. Absolutely yeah. essential. And I am left in the dust because <laughs> I, I, I never learned how to do this. Yeah, I Instead, am becoming I did, dust. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did podcast. You know. Right, right. But at least I understand what's going no, I on. Got, I got you. All right. So then the question is, let's compare different cells and see what happens. So right. what they do is they they measure, they do the transcriptome by this RNA-seq on a couple of samples. They take macrophages, which again mm -hmm. is the primary latent target of this gamma-68. Right. And they take, um, they, they infect mice and then they sort the macrophages and they separate the virus-infected ones and the virus-negative ones. They've used the virus with a, a fluorescent protein that they can use to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we have virus-infected so and virus-infected and then they do the transcriptome of those. And then as controls, they take macrophages and they treat them with IL-4, which is a uh -huh. TH2, or interferon gamma, which is a, a TH1. One. So they want to know what the transcriptome looks like under TH1 and TH2 conditions. Got it. Got it? Got it. And then they compare that to the virus infected and the virus uninfected mm. transcriptome. Perfect. Now, this is all described in five sentences. Right. This is what I'm saying here. Do you know how much data is involved? We in just it? took 20 minutes to talk about that. And we haven't even got to the results. So you want to know what the results are? I'm dying to know what the results are. That's All right. Virus negative cells. Yes. Their transcriptome. Yes. Looked like the Th2. Uh-huh. Cells are the ones treated with IL-4. Those are the immunoregulatory cells. All right. Characterized by IL-4, among other things. The virus infected cells showed a Th1 profile. Character it characterized by interferon gamma. Okay. So virus infected looked like Th1. Virus uninfected looked like Th2. Okay, so mm -hmm. far? Yep. So this suggests that interferon gamma is important for regulating virus infection. It provides more, more data for that. Right. But it also is the case that IL-4 seems to be involved. In fact, they looked at markers in macrophages that would tell them whether they were uh, t making TH2 cytokines or not. And whether the virus-infected macrophages could be uh, either TH1 or TH2, okay? Because some of them were showed this marker of TH2 activation and some of them did not. So they say TH4, not only is interferon gamma involved, but TH2. IL-4 seems to be involved as well. Is this getting too complicated, Dixon? You're, not you're, yet. Your eyes are closing. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> he just made that up, everybody. My eyes were wide open. All right, so interferon gamma we know keeps down. Yeah, no, no. Right. IL-4 seems to have a role uh, in infection as well. So now they're pursuing IL-4. What is IL-4 doing? IL-4, remember, is a TH2 cytokine. It's produced during the TH2 response. It can enhance the TH2 response as well, Okay. You okay? If you I'm take fine. if you take mice that have been infected with gamma sixty eight latently, and you treat them with IL four, enhances viral replication. Uh huh. IL four. But that's a TH one response, right? Two. No, but the virus replicates under the conditions of two because the TH one responses are off. 
Well, no, the TH1 is interferon gamma is right. keeping the right. The idea is that it keeps the virus in latency, somehow, right? Low levels, but somehow IL4, which is a TH2, is it shuts that it. off. It's reversing it in some way because exactly. if you treat the mice exactly. or the infected yeah. bone marrow derived macrophages yeah. with IL4, I got, I got they make it. virus. I got it. I got it. All right. I got it. Now IL4, when you add it to cells, it binds to a cell surface receptor. It's called the IL-4 receptor. G. <laughs> <laughs> and that binding is very much, does, it, does something very much like interferon binding to its receptor. It causes a signaling cascade, which ends up turning on genes in the nucleus. Hmm. The, one of the proteins, the stat proteins are involved in interferon signaling. And there's another stat protein involved in IL-4 signaling. It's called STAT-6. Right. The first one is called STAT-1. Is it's STAT-1 or 2 for interferons, right. alpha, right, right, alpha, right, beta, right. gamma. And STAT stands for? Signaling, signal transducers and activation of transcription. There you go. What happens is that when the ligand binds the receptor, when interferon binds the receptor, the STATs get phosphorylated, they can dimerize, they go in the nucleus, and they sit on a promoter and turn on genes. Got it. If you take mice lacking STAT-6, Huh. And you infect them with... Be like a knockout? A knockout, and you infect them with gamma herpes virus oh. 68. They become latently infected. Wow. If you add IL-4, it doesn't increase virus replication. No. It doesn't bring them out of latency. No. You need STAT-6. Right. Which makes sense, because that STAT-6 is the signaler from IL-4 receptor to the nucleus. You okay? But I'm okay, but it doesn't explain exactly what STAT-6 does. Well... What STAT-6 is known to do already before this paper is that it becomes phosphorylated when IL-4 binds the receptor. Yes. It dimerizes and goes into the nucleus where it turns on the synthesis of IL-4-induced genes. Is herpes a nuclear virus? It certainly is. Well, <clears throat> then, IL, then STAT-6 might have a chance to interact with the virus itself. With the genome, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. How did you know that? I just guessed. No, I actually read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. Did. I read the paper. And I think I understood basically the essence of the paper. So in one configuration where it's where it's um latent, stat one is present, which inhibits the viral replication. And interferon gamma, which it yeah. leads to stat But if one stat six is present, does it displace stat one and then liberate the virus so it can go on to reproduce? When IL four is present, yep. stat six is activated. Right. Uh, yes, that's the rest of the paper, which you didn't let me get to. Oh, did I, you can edit this out if you'd like. No, it's fine. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I understood the paper. That's no, fine. That's so all. basically, after reading it four times, the, the upshot is that IL IL four is somehow antagonizing the effect of interferon gamma, which helps keep the virus in its latent state. Right by inducing STAT one. There is a gene called the latent to lytic switch gene in the well, viral genome. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the other paper. Oh, Dixon. sorry. Did you read the other one? I read both of them. Yeah, I got them all mixed up. Called, this is a viral gene. It's a gamma no, herpes virus 68 viral gene. It's called gene 50. Ah, right. Okay. It regulates the switch back. from latency to lytic infection. So, Dixon, okay. you have a mouse. Right. It's latently infected with right. this gamma 68. Right. That means there's genomes in macrophages, but they're not producing virus. Right. Gene 50, when activated, can make l virus be produced. In other words, enter the lytic phase. Huh. All right? Return to the old days before right. our immune system kicked in. Interferon gamma suppresses this gene 50. It doesn't let it get turned on. It sits on the promoter, and there's no gene 50. That's why, we, that's why this virus stays in latency. Got it. Infected mice. Got it. And IL-4 antagonizes that. Do we know what gene 50 actually is in terms of its protein function? It's the latent to lytic switch gene. You want to know how it works? <laughs> yeah, sure. Is it a basic helix loop helix protein or something of that sort? You know, that's a very smart conclusion. It should be a transcriptional activator of some sort because you would think getting out of latency would require turning on a bunch of other genes. And it's so I, would get, I don't know guess. offhand, but I, I guess that's what it is. Okay. If you don't want me to go look it up No, right that's now. okay. That's okay. All right. So basically, and then what they showed is that uh, STAT6 normally sits on the promoter for this gene 50 and keeps it quiet. All right? And that's why you stay in latency. But when IL-4 is present... Stat six 
No, did I say stat six before? No, you said stat one. Stat one, stat which is a product of interferon gamma, right. sits on the promoter. Right. Stat six, which uh, is induced by IL-4, yeah. bumps it off, turns on the gene, you go into lytic phase. How about that? Are and those related? I mean, the stats are, when you line them all up and yeah, do the amino acid sequences, they're all related they're to related, each other, yeah. and there's just an area of difference that Well, they, makes they have different work. receptors that they associate with, like the okay. you know, if you're an alpha, beta, okay. gamma. Okay. But they're produced in the nucleus or produced in the cytoplasm and then go into the nucleus? Well, the protein is made in the cytoplasm. All right, because some are made in the nucleus, right? Protein is always made in the cytoplasm. In the nucleus, I think nucleus the, does not the translate. Nucleus. I thought the nucleus. No, Tr protein is made in the in the cytoplasm right, 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 of the right, right, cell. Right, right. mRNAs are made in the nucleus. So it needs a nuclear pore signal to get into the nucleus, then too. Yeah, well, that's part of the activation of right. the protein All that right. it can get okay. imported. Normally, the protein, if it's not activated, okay. sits in the cytoplasm. But when a IL four molecule sits on the receptor, so protein is activated so they can get through the pore. Yeah. Question: What signal enters the nucleus to tell the cyto to tell them the, the DNA to make the message to put the stat one protein synthesis going that makes it come back into the nucleus? What well, is that so signal? It, there's a there's a there's a basal level of stat synthesis in cells. You need to have the stat proteins no, no, in the I cytoplasm. Got, okay. But then th their synthesis is turned on by the same signaling that they're. they're so it must going. be a smaller molecule, or I mean, no? What do you? I'm, I'm trying to... Stats are present in the cytoplasm. Now I'm working out how does this... They're always made. They're constitutively they're synthesized made. Okay, at a low okay, level. Okay, 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 and then okay, okay. when the receptors are engaged, okay, they dimerize, okay, they go fine. in the nucleus, and then they they're can turn more, more of themselves on. They're already... They're already yeah, right? Okay. So interferon gamma is blocking this gene 50 promoter. Keeps it the virus in latency. And IL-4... Induces STAT6 activation that goes in the nucleus, sits on the promoter, probably bumps off whatever interferon gamma has done there, and turns on the lytic state. Got it. Okay. Right. And none of this works in STAT6 knockout mice. So it's a two signal thing. Got it. You have to have STAT6 and you got to bump off the interferon gamma uh, regulation. Cool. Now, I wonder if it is STAT, a STAT protein. Uh, induced by interferon gamma. I'm looking through here, and I'm not I'm not seeing uh, evidence for this, but I could be missing it. All right, so I, I said before that STAT1 is is sitting on the promoter, but I'm not sure that they know that ah. to keep it silent. It's doing something, though. So basically, you need two signals. you got to get rid of the interferon gamma inhibition, and then you need a positive activator caused by IL-4. Right. And... And, you know, there are human gamma herpes viruses. Okay. So Kaposi sarcoma herpes oh, yeah. virus. So they oh, ask yeah. in cells infected latently with that, can um, IL-4 activate the lytic program? And the answer is yes. Is. Adding IL-4 right. can induce a reactivation of Kaposi okay. sarcoma okay. virus. So this is very, so the viral promoter for this gene 50, which is a key regulator of the latent the lytic switch, this has evolved. The promoter of that gene has evolved to sense the immune state of the cell, right? Right. Because whether IL gamma or IL four, sorry, interferon gamma or IL four is present, the promoter can react in different ways. So that's interesting. So the virus would like to quote unquote know what the immune status of the host is. So when things are trending towards IL uh, Th two antibody responses, the virus says we need to reactivate and get out of here. Right. Because otherwise the antibodies might right. be a problem. Right. I don't know if that's the, the way it worked, but... Are there antibodies that neutralize herpes viruses once they are activated? Yes, virions, but you can't neutralize the yeah. genome, right? No. If there's no virion, no. you can't neutralize that's it. That's true. And there are no antibodies against the virion, I take it. Oh, you do make antibodies. No, I meant course. against the, the the genome of it. I mean, I know you can have anti-DNA antibodies. Well, anti yeah, but I'm not sure that they've ever been okay. shown to do okay. anything. Okay. Just asking. So here, the thing is, Dixon, there are a couple of implications of this. First of all, people are thinking of using hookworms for immunotherapy. They right? are. In fact, they, they reference a paper, and they're saying, maybe this is not such a good idea. If almost everyone has herpes viruses, maybe you're going to reactivate the latent mm. infections. It's something that you should look at, don't you think? These are not no, not no. I would, I would. 
They're going to use hookworm infections to ablate the overt signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease. All right. right, but what if those people yes. have a herpes virus latency, and now this activates it? So I have a question for you: Is there an antiviral problems? that? Yeah, right. So you better be ready with those. That's exactly what I'm saying. Exactly right. So these are unusual people to begin with. Crohn's disease is not everybody's disease. I got it. But Dixon, so now that we know that this, sure. these helminths can reactivate a herpes virus mm-hmm. infection. You have to be ready to yeah. treat. If this work hadn't been done, wait. You know they would treat people and say, "Oh my God, these people are dying of herpes virus." Yeah, wait. I got a larger issue for you here. Okay, a but much- wait, that was the first issue. Yeah, go on. Um, the second issue, they say, in Uganda, yes, several prevalence to capaces is associated with hookworm. Uh-huh. So it could be that out there in the wild, this is already it's, happening. It could be. Okay, so all I'm saying is, Dixon, if you want to use hookworms to immunosuppress to keep Crohn's and other inflammatory bowel diseases. They don't have those diseases in Africa. You should be careful of herpes viruses. They do not have those diseases in Africa. So are you saying that the people who would be treated for Crohn's and inflammatory bowel diseases, they're they're not going to have parasites in their gut tracts? They don't. They're people that live in the new world, (laughs) mostly. Let me read, live in let me sanitized read, uh, areas. Let me read this sentence to you then, Dixon, okay? I mean, we've, dis- we've discussed this before when we uh, talked about uh, the peaceful use of helminths. <laughs> Co-infection may govern the outcome of reactivation by changing the balance in IL-4 and interferon gamma, right. thus raising a potential issue with herpes virus reactivation and proposed live helminth therapies. So you're saying this is a non-issue. I would say it's a minor issue. If I had Crohn's disease... No, no, no. Of course it's an issue. Because here in this no, no, country no. is where we're treating people. We're <coughs> giving right. them live helminths. We are. We're going to turn on their herpes infections. We might. Okay, if so you have it. Everybody has a herpes infection. Well, in infection. that case, treat them with acyclovir at the same time. Would you do it before or only You're the after? virologist. You answer the question. <laughs> so someone has to do a clinical trial where... Yeah, yeah. You treat people with helminths, right. and then you measure reactivation of herpes viruses right. to see, oh, oh, does it happen in 100% of people? Exactly. Then, yes, you would give preemptive acyclovir exactly. beforehand. Exactly. At least you have an, an out. You have a strategy. I have a larger issue. If they don't raise that, I have okay. a much larger Go issue ahead. at stake here. Yeah. And that is the WHO and other uh, agencies yeah. would love – to use all of the power that they have to vaccinate everybody against whatever they can vaccinate them against. Mm -hmm. And many of these vaccines are uh, infectious agent positive (laughs) vaccines. Yellow fever vaccine, one of the polio vaccines, the measles vaccine, the mumps vaccine. All those are what you would call live virus vaccines. Mm -hmm. All right? When those children that you're going to give that vaccine to have a helminth infection to begin with, what do you think will happen to those infections? That they intend to be vaccines. Instead, they become, I don't know, fill in the blank. Will they become an overwhelming viral infection instead of a vaccine that trickles out uh, organisms every now and then to keep the immune system boosted? Are we going to run the risk of uh, out-of-control viral infections through a vaccination program, which is well-intentioned, but in the light of the fact that we now know that helminth infections can interfere with immunity to, to viruses, is this going to screw up the vaccine programs Could be. that already exist? So That's my larger question. I mean, question. In, the, in the second paper, they show that yep. these helminth infections interfere with uh, with cellular TH1 responses, which would yeah, help clear a yeah. virus infection. That's right. Maybe we'll do that paper on TWIV. But, yeah, so that could be an issue. The, the vaccines could. could. It could. They might get out of control. But we have a lot of history already, though, don't we? We have a lot of history with measles. We have a lot of history with polio. And in areas where the worm infections are really high. We don't see a problem, right? Well, maybe they didn't look for it. Well, there's... Look, you can say the polio vaccine isn't causing polio in worm-infested no. areas of no, the world. and you don't have a lot of neuro, neurotropic uh, uh, polio. Wild that polio. Would have been, that would have been reported, right? Yeah, because we have a good surveillance system. Right, so I'm then questioning the, the uh, importance of this finding. 
The importance is here in the U.S. where we're going to treat uh, inflammatory bowel okay. disease with okay. live these are, helmets. These are special people that we're talking I don't, about. I think a lot of people have these diseases. Crohn's? Dixon. Look at yes. up. No, I don't think it's a very high percentage. I don't know. Everyone I seem to talk to has Crohn's or IBD, <laughs> Dixon. No, I think the Crohn's disease, I think it's less than 1% of the population. All right. Well, I'm sure Robin will tell us. Right. <laughs> Actually, here's the number, Dixon. Yeah. Let's have the number. Well, in- inflammatory bowel disease, two per 100,000 people, ages, two ages per zero to 19. Thousand. That's. How many people in the U.S.? Uh, much less. Uh, that, what's the population of the U.S.? Uh, 380 million people. The point is, Dixon. No, it's still a lot of numbers. That I, I think there's many a big people number. are ill with these diseases. No, no, I don't doubt and they, that. We need a least. treatment. And Correct. if you're thinking of doing helmets, you have to now be looking out that's for reactivated right. herpes. Right. That, that is, is the point. This is okay. absolutely correct. Dixon, what should we call this? Uh, I think we should call this Transformers. <laughs> helmets go viral? <laughs> well, they are, they've already used that. I know. That's a shame because that is my title and science usurped it. Did they? Yeah. I should, yeah, have, patented, I should have patented or <laughs> trademarked it, right? <laughs> We'll think of a good time. I'm telling you, don't Dixon, I don't get no respect. No. No. It's a twip quiv. <laughs> you don't have a title, huh? T T W I P V. Twib. All right, I, I'm going to have to make it up myself. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. You want to uh, read do some, some email. email? Yeah. Let's read some email. First one's from Francois. Vincent, you've got French listeners, at least one. I don't know. Now, listen, Dixon. A few, a few episodes ago, we wondered if anyone was listening in France. So That's Francois true. says, you've got at least one. He's living in Montpellier in the south of France where the sun is shining. <laughs> he also sent an image huh. along with his email. Right. Here it is, Dixon. It's a, it's a picture of cheese. <laughs> under glass it's called terrifying french invaders <laughs> and underneath coming soon with their effing culture and smelling cheese oh dear i didn't say the word no you didn't you were very good here are two very visual pics of the week you already know of the glass virus of luke jerram right but here is his malaria model <gasps> oh, so he's made a malaria glass oh sculpture oh did goodness. you know that i did not you know who luke jerram is i know yeah, basically. I Here's know. the malaria in glass. Oh, wow. It's pretty nice, right? I'll go look that up on my uh, computer out in my office when, and, we, when um, we're finished. Well, that's not a Toxocara, wow. so no, we can't use it for the episode art. Right. And then uh, for sheer beauty, giant glass flowers from Jason. Oh, ah, well, that, those are always good. Do you remember those? I showed them to yeah, you. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. look at them. He's got a. They're gorgeous. I mean, they're just trap. It's bigger than he is. They're fabulous. They're fabulous. Look at this. This is great. <laughs> this is just wonderful. Gorgeous pitcher plants. Totally agree. Totally agree. Orchids. Yeah. Nice. Really nice. They're Terrific. not viruses. They're not parasites. But no, they're, they're beautiful. Not. They're gorgeous. All right, you want? Can you read an email? Or I will good? try. Next one is from Robin, who's got a lot of items. Okay, various items. Robin writes various items. Malaria prevalence can be so high that asymptomatic parasitemia is the norm. It was ninety-five plus percent among adults of some New Guinea tribes, and over seventy percent among adults in the territory of Anopheles Gambii. French speakers. Among the reasons I am not a French speaker were Horatio Nelson and the Duke of Wellington, to neither of whom I have any affinity or allegiance. But they were among the reasons that the Raj was a, big, was a British Raj and not a French one. An important reason also why so many Indians and Pakistanis speak adequate, if not good English, and a little or no French. <laughs> Skyzant pronunciation. <laughs> he gives a reference for the pronunciation of Skyzant. Is that how you say it? Skyzant? I say Skyzant, but I've heard it Shizant or Shizant. I've heard three different ways of saying it. I think yeah, so here they're all can, correct. You can play the audio. The Shizant pronunciation game, I guess. Okay. Okay, single versus multiple ring forms. Multiple ring forms in an RBC is bad news. I would totally agree with that. It means the parasitemia is pretty high. Parasites are doomed. As in the answer to the question about Bob Dole in 1996 presidential election, does he wear boxers or briefs? 
And the answer is, depends. Those that adapt well enough may become a necessary feature, as Dr. Dixon has explained, with regards to intestinal parasites and autoimmune disorders of the gut, and perhaps elsewhere. It's not, let's not forget the bacterium that invaded an Archean to produce the great gazillion grandparent of all of today's eukaryotes. Mitochondria are no longer parasites. Extra membrane protein in red blood cell cytoplasm. One reason for it may be to prolong the life of the red blood cells. Think of a tire filled with tread that can migrate to the outside as the tread on the outside is worn away. Red blood cells are subject to plenty of wear as they squeeze through narrow capillaries. Hmm. Movement of Homo sapiens and other hominids outside Africa extincted by human disease. There were two known non-sapien lineages outside Africa in later times that we met, Neanderthals and Denisovians. We may have also met Florensis, but there is no genetic evidence for commingling. Just about all other hominid species were in Africa and were exposed to the infective load found there. Moreover, we coexisted with Neanderthal for 10 millennia or more. Without our species, 14... Within, within our species? I'm sorry. I'm really sorry to correct you. No, 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 please do. I'll, I'll do this again. Within our species, 14 disease-free millennia after crossing the Bering Land Bridge into the New World and several more disease-free millennia preceding the, in Siberia helped to make Native Americans susceptible to smallpox and measles, thus enabling settlement of vacated territory by Europeans who brought those diseases as naturally as their ectoparasites. Homo habilis evolved into Neanderthal. I had the impression that it was a more advanced form, Homo heidelbergensis. I think a lot of this has been rearranged in the meantime because of some new genetic evidence. I'll I'll try to be more studious uh, in this area next time. Colder climate, invasive species. The hairless ape is adapted to year-round tropical weather. Anywhere else, it is an invasive species. To survive elsewhere... It had a cultural technological adaptation that proceeded much faster than evolution, shelter, and clothing. Cause of migration, civil war. Not necessarily. It would be doubtful whether the migration across the Bering Land Bridge was due to civil war. The migration of Jews out of Europe in the time of the Third Reich was not quite due to civil war, or of Americans out of their lands annexed by Turkey. Armenians. Or of Armenians out of their lands annexed by Turkey. Absolutely correct. Extravasation. 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 I think that's how you pronounce that. Coming out of a vessel. In parens. Vas equals vessel. Could be a tubular vessel such as for blood or lymph, but also a sac-like vessel such as for urine or bile. Malarial parasites coming out of a red blood cell don't quite cut the mustard. (laughs) A reminder for the upcoming podcast. Ask parasitologists from Mayo Clinic about lice and anemia. Yeah, we did. Excellent. Bobby Pritt. Right. My personal guess is that it would not be due to depletion by volume, but perhaps the adaptation of the body to some substance injected by the lice to act as a signal that causes the body to make the blood less nutritious. And in case Dr. Dixon wants to know what she looks like, there's a picture. By the way... This um, picture of Robin, who's not a woman, as you suggested. Uh, well, no, I didn't, guy. but I just said it, it, it could also be a woman's name. I read an interesting teaser, which I'm going to follow up on for our next twip, and that is as follows. This is an alert, okay? Mm. Apparently, when malaria reproduces inside of a human host in a synchronous fashion... Yes. And gets to the point in its life cycle when the pre-sex cells, okay, Mm -hmm. the macrogametocyte and the microgametocytes are produced, it changes the body odor of the person to favor attracting to it female virgin Anopheles mosquitoes so that they can pick up the infection and carry on the life cycle. Because remember, malaria is a parasite of mosquitoes, not people this is a paper you're referring to yeah this would be remarkable if true remember the one we did about scents i do i do was your work no i no. well there was one paper that we reviewed once of a um 
of a tobacco hornworm caterpillar eating a tobacco plant, the injury elicited a pheromone produced by the tobacco plant, mm-hmm. which attracted to it a parasitic wasp, which then identified the tobacco hornworm and laid its eggs on it. The eggs penetrated the cuticle and became an infection of the... Uh, yeah. So that's you, remarkable let's, biology. Let's do this paper next time. I, I pointed it out to you in the American Scientist. Yeah. I just saw a little blurb we'll on it, but I'm sure the that there's a full paper on this. It would All be right. remarkable if true. Okay. Next the email's wow. from David. Yes. Uh, this is when I was talking about my flight, my upcoming flight <laughs> to Melbourne, Australia, oh, which yes. is long done. It's very long. In long flight, yes. What is a chief but invisible physiodynamic consequence of even short flights? Deep vein thrombosis in lower extremities. This is true. Cuts loose as ambulating off plane, throws emboli to lungs, even heart, brain. Pulmonary right. embolism is a big deal. Yes, it is. Prophylaxis, wiggle your feet, That's ankles, right. calves That's regularly. Right. That's right. Venous return is passive and hydraulically driven by muscle massage of lower veins in the right. course of everyday activity. Right. Lack of activity lets blood accumulate above vein valves, leg right. bent at knee, right. and dependent further kinks veins. Unmoving blood begins clotting, <laughs> especially in guys of a certain age. If not troubled in flight, then, then they walk off the plane and collapse. Yeah. Ooh. To prevent, extend legs and isometrically flex and extend them even when bent. Exactly. Get up and about in, any, in flight at any excuse and yeah. for none. <laughs> Alcohol may repress clotting Ooh. some <laughs> at minimally higher risk of uncontrolled bleeding. A yeah. bit of aspirin probably wouldn't hurt. That's Bloody right. Marys are nutritious. <laughs> Travel well. Wish I were there. Dave from Fresno. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's very good. I. The thing is, if you fall asleep, you can't be... Moving your legs. I try and do flex and exercise. If you travel around. business class, they at least let you stretch out. And if you do that, Does that help. That yeah, helps the because Venus then return you're then, moving right? about and you're rolling over and all that other but stuff. But the Venus return then is easier because you're much not easier. That's much easier. That's coming right. up. Yeah. That's correct. Do you ever have a deep vein from thrombosis? Never, Dixon? thank God. Because if I did, I would be probably in a hospital someplace. I do take an aspirin every day, a full aspirin. Uh, and I do get up and move around, and I do isometrics also. And uh, my wife encourages me to wear these uh, support stockings mm-hmm. that actually uh, yeah I wear them they're elastic and, and they seem to help too let's do two more so okay Tristan writes dear Vincent and Dixon D-I-X-O-N it's actually D-I-C-K-S-O-N well, we've just changed your name that's fine I'll change my name that's fine I'm not sure if you got my email a few weeks ago since I sent it from my personal email and not through the website so I'm sending it again just in case I have to tell you that I'm a huge fan of TWIP, and I love listening to you guys, exclamation point. In November 2013, I did my first medical mission trip to Nzara, South Sudan. Vincent, you probably already know an interesting virology fact about Nzara. It's one of the first places Ebola virus was discovered in 1976. After the short trip, I enjoyed the work so much that I am now trying to gain funding so I can leave life here and continue the work in Nzara for a couple of years. I appreciate how your podcasts are both educational and entertaining at the same time. My favorite one so far is when you had Dr. Peter Hotez on talking about neglected tropical diseases. We might want to have him on again, too. You guys should really do an episode about chronic malarial infection in children living in sub-Saharan Africa and the connection between Epstein-Barr virus and the high rate of pediatric Burkitt's lymphoma diagnosis. And I actually meant to mention that earlier in in this show because... Ooh, what a- me. Does malaria do a TH2? It does both. <laughs> so maybe it's inducing, it's yeah. reactivating Epstein-Barr. Yeah, but you know what? There's a certain region in Africa where Epstein, uh, where Burkitt's lymphoma is, is endogenous, but not all over Africa. So it's it's got some genetic components too from the host perhaps. People get tired of hearing about malaria, but this would be a great podcast because it combines parasitology and virology. I find it quite interesting and happened to learn about this connection when I had Plasmodium malariae after returning from my trip, despite taking Malarone. Thank you both for your good work and for giving me such valuable information, which I can take back with me to South Sudan. And she gives several uh, websites. Oh, she, again, you assume. He, she. Tristan. Tristan. Yeah, I have no idea whether that's male or female. I don't know. Uh, at any rate, so there's female. a reference to the malaria Epstein Barr virus. So I'm looking at her Facebook yes. page, and okay. it is definitely female. Yes. All right. So you want to read the one from uh, 
Zephyr. Nice. Look at this picture here. He's got a picture there of the oh. Nizara and there with lovely. some people. Lovely, lovely. Uh, Dixon, can we do this uh, EBV? Sure. Story? Absolutely. You betcha. All right. The last one is from Zephyr, who writes, yeah. Hello, Doctors Vincent and Dick. Right. In the episode TWIP 73, Entamoeba Histolytica, <laughs> yeah. I heard the following misconception. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No mistake Dick, is a better way to put that. This Dick Tape on me at 44 minutes and 33 seconds. Name a mammal that has nucleated red blood cells. Camels. In spite of the rather peculiar elliptical shape and other abnormal features, see below, camelid red blood cells are by no means nucleated. Yeah, they just look that way. And he gives a quote. Yeah, no, you're right. Which reads uh, about, talks Duh. all about the, the morphology of camel red Duh. blood cells. Among the mammals, members of the family Camelides, camels, vicuñas, guanacos, llamas, alpacas are unique in that their erythrocytes, though a nucleate, are elliptical. Right. The question thus arises as to whether MBs play a role in cell shape generation and or maintenance of these species. NBs stands for marginal bands. And uh, you saw some alpacas recently, didn't you? I saw vicuñas, alpacas, and llamas. Those are all camelidae. They are. And I've seen guanacos before that, and I've seen camels, so I think I've seen all of the camelidae. So he sent pictures of camelid red blood nice. cells. Nice. So, uh, I, I, of course, of course. They, when you look at them under the microscope, there is a dense center, so it appears to be a nucleus, but you're absolutely right that uh, they're not normal blasts. They are erythrocytes. Seems to be a rather right. widespread confusion in educational circles. I also succumbed to this <laughs> false notion during my undergraduate years. Uh -huh. Then one day I decided to look up the possible <laughs> advantages that could offer the presence of nucleated cells in camels. My wild right. guess was that perhaps those red blood cells could work in tandem with they're also rather peculiar <laughs> subset of homodimeric immunoglobulin G to keep at bay particularly harmful right, parasites right. that might have infested those animals at some point. It turned out that it had nothing to do in the characteristic elliptical shape of their red blood cells are thought to be an adaptation to extreme dehydration and rapid rehydration. That makes sense. That and makes possibly sense. to increase the efficiency for carrying oxygen at high altitude. That does make sense. Can I ask... Uh, I'm sorry, you're not finished and he, reading. He also... Uh, Gives a lot of more text about the description of these sure. and llamas. Sure. Zephyr. What a nice name, Zephyr. Not bad. Would you like that? I, I like Zephyr very much. Fast. Yeah. <laughs> Would you mind going to the internet, since I don't have my computer turned on to that particular mode, and look up um, amphibian red blood cells? Because I seem to recall that they <laughs> are nucleated. Rem Amphibian red blood cells. Okay. Yes. What would you... Images. Just go to the image section and see what they show you. Okay. You you think they're nuclear? I do be, think so. Do you want to get more email? No, no, no. Yeah, they are nucleated. Oh, good. Would you say that those are nuclei? I would absolutely say they are. Those are nucleated red cells. Amphibia. Chicken red blood cells are nucleated. I was also, also going to say that, um, that uh, avian red blood cells are, because I know that the duck... Plasmodium lofuri, which infects ducks, mm. has a nucleated red cell. Um, I so used to work on, when I was a graduate student, I did a little work on chicken red blood cells, oh, yeah. and I remember they were. All right. Let me just read two quick ones from Absolutely. Curtis. Maybe you've already done a segment on Toxocara. We, we just did. And it's well, the basic, <laughs> and it's hidden under a clever title. But if you haven't done one so far, would you consider doing a podcast? I just discovered TWIP, and what a treasure trove it is. Thanks for all your efforts. Oh, great. If you go back to the um, TWIP on Ascaris, which is an early one, I, I, it must be TWIP 5 or 6 or 8, I'm gonna, something I'm like I'm going to get the whole archive right now. We're going to... All right. So... Um, I, we can recommend which one it was. Yeah, we're going to tell them. Toxicara had its own, I think. Number, which one do you want me to look at? Sorry. Look at Ascaris. Ascaris. It's underneath that one, I think. It's we not going to be tapeworms, right? No, 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 no. Um, Nematodes. We did, we did the uh, tapeworms first, right? All I right, the so. giant intestinal worm, that's Ascaris one. lumbricoides. That's yes. That's number 21. Oh, okay, okay. W why are you thinking? Because I think along with it, we mentioned some other Ascarids. And Toxicara is one of those Ascarids. Didn't we have a, an episode on Toxicara? Well, itself? if we did, it should be under our archives then. It should be pretty soon after the Ascaris. Well, let's do a search. Twip, Toxocara canis. Right, right, right. right. Uh, you're right. It's under 21. There you go. So we didn't do a 
episode on Toxicara on its own. You know, you're right. It's here. We have the life cycle. Yeah. But it's so similar that we would, we it don't is. need to do. That's true. All right. Twip 21, the giant intestinal worm, Ascaris lumbricoides. And you have a right. picture of that. <laughs> jar of worms. Jar of worms. A <laughs> yeah, big jar. Carboy. Jar o worms. Carboy right? of worms. Uh, and the last one is from... John, who writes, Dixon sometimes mentions how crows eat roadkill. They right. eat the contents of the animal's intestines rather than its parasite-infested organs. I witnessed right. a crow eating a California ground squirrel, and Dixon's explanation helped me understand that the crow was not playing with its food, but rather being <laughs> picky. I right. shot a video, which may be too graphic <laughs> for some listeners. He posted a link to that. Technically, my crow is a raven, uh, yeah, which uh, is a yeah. fancy yeah. name for a crow with a big beak. <laughs> Did you uh, look at this, Dixon? Not yet, but I will now. It, it, it's on Flickr, Dixon. Do you know what Flickr is? I, I have a vague no notion of look, what that is. So I, here's you know. a wonderful raven, and there's the dead squirrel underneath it. Right. And the raven is, the, the squirrel is on its back. Right. And you can see that the raven is, um, well, right now it's not doing anything, is it? Yeah, it's not moving. Oh, it's not flicking. <laughs> oh, I had to start my flash plugin. I didn't realize these uh, videos see, this were. Is the, this is the reason why I don't. I, I, you know, I'm sort of a. Dixon, it takes one click to get it I'm going. I'm a luddite. Basically, I'm a luddite. You're a luddite. I think I'm a luddite. Yeah. Anyway, the crow, the raven, is going to pick at the. Uh, right. Well, I've squirrel. watched that happen also. And this this young man who listens to Twip, he took a video for us, and Great. we're going to put a link. Uh, in the show notes to that, and if you have flat, you'll need flash enabled on your. <laughs> Mine went to sleep, uh, and that will do it for twip number seventy six. Dixon, can you promise me to do another twip? Soon? But of course. When are you going away next week? Uh, I am actually. I said the week after. Are you back? Yeah. I'm going to nail you to a the date right now. <laughs> Today is September second. You're gone yes. the week of the eighth. Is that yes. correct? I'll be back on the twelfth. So the thirteenth or fourteenth would be good. That's probably it's Saturday or Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. Well, How about... Um, the 15th and 16th, I'll be in Detroit. I'll be in Georgia. Right. How about the 18th? Done. Really? That's a deal. It's a Thursday. We just shook on that, well, so to speak. Yeah, we shook. Really? The 18th? Now, September how are you going to remember? Because you don't write it down. You don't. Put no, it no, I'll go outside in my office cow. right now, and I'll write that down. I'll etch it in my mind. <sighs> but I want to do the one on the uh, odor. Odor, find the paper. I'm going to find that paper, because it was in That'd the American Scientist last issue, so... Uh, what a remarkable biological advantage that gives to malaria of finding the proper person to take the blood meal from to catch malaria. All of course, right. the malaria parasite well, did that. This is episode 76 of TWIP. We recorded this on the afternoon of September 2nd. I'm gonna, this is going to be posted within a few hours. I'm putting it right up. Great. Because people need their TWIP fix. They do. So and, we, uh, you can find this at microbeworld.org slash twip. You can also find it on iTunes. And, and do send us your questions and comments. We love getting them. Twip yes, we at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier can be found at urbanag.ws. His latest podcast, Urban Agriculture, and of course, verticalform.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to see you in the parasite mode again. Um, it's great to be back. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear at the beginning and end of TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is Parasitic. parasitic.